Stay tuned for later in this episode to find out how you can have a chance to win this Superformance Cobra Mark III R. It's come to my attention that our competitors at Mercury have a new minivan. Back in 1992, Ford's Mercury division introduced the Villager minivan as a front-wheel drive and less truck-like alternative to the Ford Aerostar. Although it was one of the few cars Mercury ever sold that wasn't a rebadged Ford, for the most part it wasn't a Mercury or a Ford, since the development, engineering, and engines were provided by Nissan, who offered a nearly identical minivan, the Quest. Although the Villager made it to a second generation and gained an extra door, low sales ended it by 2002, while Nissan managed to keep the Quest in production until 2017. This is the story of the Mercury Villager and his twin, the Nissan Quest. This is my old car. Sliding rear seat, standard anti-lock brakes, drives like a car. Who would want a minivan that drives like a car? Certainly not anyone who works for me. Mercury Villager. If it was just another minivan, it wouldn't be a Mercury. All this and the quality of a Mercury. My old car is now on Instagram. Follow me at myoldcar1981 to send suggestions for future episodes. And use the hashtag myoldcar1981 to share photos of your old car. After I released my Ford Aerostar episode, I got several requests to review the Villager. And some replied that they didn't know it was a rebadged Nissan when I revealed that in that episode. I grew up in the Detroit area, and so American branded cars were more common in Southeast Michigan back then. So I rarely saw the Nissan Quest. So I was surprised to see that the Quest returned for two more generations. I'll cover those here too. And as minivans go, the Quest from the 2000s were quite bizarre. Let me know in the comments if you agree. A big thank you to Omaze for sponsoring today's video. Oh my God, yes! <laughs> Omaze gave away over $27 million to charity in 2021 and is now offering you a chance to win a Superformance Cobra. And you can support a great cause, the Peterson Automotive Museum in downtown Los Angeles. Go to omaze.com slash myoldcar to enter for your chance to win. If you're watching this channel, then of course you like old cars. And so you may think this is a Shelby Cobra that has been around since the 1960s, but you'd be wrong. This Superformance Cobra Mark III R is all new. Underneath its custom body and frame is a 7.3 liter Ford Godzilla V8, a Tremec 5-speed manual transmission, and 650 horsepower. It also has all the features listed here. Remember, your donation helps support the amazing work of the Peterson Automotive Museum, a nonprofit where you can explore the history of the automobile and experience cars you'll never find anywhere else. Go to omaze.com slash myoldcar and enter for a chance to win. The name Villager wasn't a new name for Ford or Mercury when plans for a new front-wheel drive minivan began in 1988. Ford introduced the name as a station wagon model of their Edsel line in 1958 but like the rest of Edsel, it was gone before 1961. Mercury then used the Villager as a trim name on other wagons, like the Comet, Montego, Bobcat, Zephyr, and even the short-lived Escort clone, the Mercury Lynx. The Villager design started only a couple years after the launch of the Aerostar, Ford's answer to Chrysler's hugely successful Caravan and Voyager minivans. Unlike a Chrysler, the Aerostar was rear-wheel drive, which allowed it to have a higher tow rating than its front-wheel drive competitors and also to save costs by sharing some parts with Ford's Ranger and Bronco too. But the trade-off was a taller van with a more truck-like ride, which turned away many potential buyers. I drove it to the prong. <laughs> with a redesign for the Aerostar years away, Ford looked to their Japanese competition for a possible merger to share a new front-wheel drive minivan model. I never thought I'd see myself with the minivan, but then again, I've never seen one like this new Mercury Villager. But it needed to be a company which didn't already have its own successful minivan selling in North America, thereby making the merger a benefit for both. Nissan was Ford's choice, as their U.S. sold minivan, which in the U.S. was simply called the Nissan Van, had been imported since 1986. It wasn't a big seller especially when word spread about the van's engine having a tendency to overheat and catch fire, thanks to a tight engine bay that wasn't designed for a larger U.S. spec engine. Despite four safety recalls, which ultimately didn't prevent the fires, in 1994, Nissan was forced to recall all of their vans in the U.S., and Nissan paid the owners to give them back. Most owners did, and Nissan subsequently crushed every old van it got back to avoid being liable for them. In 1990, Nissan also tried importing another more conventional looking van known as the Prairie in Japan, but was called the Access in North America. Although they were available to Canadian buyers for six years, 
in the US, low sales ended it after only one year. With the failure of two different van imports, Nissan entered the partnership with Ford on a new minivan design, which would be built in a Ford assembly plant in Avon Lake, Ohio. With its V6 engine, smooth, quiet ride, and easy front wheel drive handling. They look at me funny in the store too, but you taste that and tell me that's not better than a woman. Being U.S. built would also allow Nissan to avoid the overhead costs associated with importing it from Japan. That was a pot brownie. You're stoned off your ass. The Villager design, engines, and transmissions were from Nissan, although Ford's parts bin was used for the interior, such as the radio, climate control, and power window controls. This allowed Ford to concentrate more effort on the Aerostar's eventual replacement, the Windstar. The Villager would continue a standard for all minivans back then, that being only one sliding door on the passenger side, but clearly tried in its advertising to distance itself from the Aerostar's truck-like origins. Mercury Villager, now you don't have to drive a truck to drive a minivan. This joint venture also provided Nissan with their own version of the same minivan, which they named the Quest. When parked side by side, the two vans were almost identical, with only changes in front grille and badging. The Villager also had an optional digital dashboard display, which I'm sure looked cool back then, although its green screen design definitely makes it look dated today. Sweet. Villager buyers who wanted to go even more upscale could opt for the Nautica edition, initially only available in navy blue and white, and Nautica badging on the outside that matched the namesake clothing line. Mercury pushed this to be their equivalent of the Aerostar's Eddie Bauer trim. The Nautica model even came with its own set of Nautica-themed luggage. Chances are that luggage won't still be around if you find a used Nautica Villager for sale today. The popularity of the Nautica model wasn't strong enough to make it to the second-gen Villager. Both the Villager and Quest introduced more flexible seating arrangements to distinguish themselves from their rivals, such as the rear bench installed on tracks, allowing it to slide across the cargo area. They even had a two-way liftgate, so that just the rear glass could be open instead of the whole door, a feature that emulated the Mercury Sable wagon. They also simplified engine options by only offering a 3-liter V6 that was common in other Nissans of the time. Their commercials were touted as being a more powerful option than their rivals. It has a V6 engine, so it's more powerful. Which was true initially when compared to the GM Dustbuster vans that had debuted two years earlier. But the GM vans had gained an optional higher output V6 by 1992 that made their horsepower nearly identical to the Nissan engine. I mean, it is a Cadillac of minivans. More likely, they were trying to compare against the Chrysler minivans, whose V6 options were lower in horsepower. Not to mention Chrysler still offered a 100 horsepower four-cylinder. Despite the Villager being Ford's only front-wheel drive minivan, its sales were still far less than the Aerostar. In fact, the Aerostar's popularity even surprised Ford execs, who wanted to stop production of the Aerostar in 1995 upon the introduction of the front-wheel drive Windstar, and instead were faced with backlash from the public, as well as their own dealers, to keep the Aerostar in production, which they did until 1997. That was one year after Chrysler introduced their third-gen minivan, complete with a driver's side sliding door that caught Ford off guard by not offering the same in the first-gen Windstar. First to offer dual sliding doors. Introducing the 1990 Nissan Access. Ford and partner Nissan learned from that mistake and planned for the second-gen Villager and Quest to also offer the additional sliding door. Mr. DeVille, I'm ready for my close-up. And unlike the Chrysler minivans, that additional door wasn't an option, it was standard. The second sliding door on any model, long or short, had no extra charge. The second gen Villager and Quest, upon their launch in 1999, shared no sheet metal with the first gen, although it was still on its original Nissan design platform. And again, from the outside, only badging and a different grille differentiated the two, although that and a red trim piece across the back of the Villager. Nissan upgraded the engine option from a 3.0 to a 3.3 liter V6, which Nissan also used in its light-duty trucks and SUVs for the U.S. market. However, it still only produced 170 horsepower. The new minivans were 5 inches longer than the first gen, but shorter than Chrysler's long wheelbase minivans and GM's minivans, the latter having succumbed to the pressure of public outcry to kill off the old Dustbuster design. The same year of the second gen launch, both Ford and Nissan began development work on a third gen minivan in the hopes the second gen would do well enough to eventually move to the new model in the mid-2000s. Yet despite the all-new look of the second gen, sales for both the Villager and Quest still fell behind their competitors. Enough so that just the following year, 2000, Ford and Nissan agreed to plan for the end of their joint venture. A shortened 2002 model year would mark the end of the Villager minivan, which would soon be replaced by the Mercury Monterey, which itself was just a rebadge of the Ford minivan, now called the Freestar. 
By the early 2000s, sales for the entire Mercury line were on a downward trend, so it wasn't surprising to see its new minivan just be a rebadge. Minivan sales in general were not nearly as good as they once were, and those customers that did buy minivans still mostly bought from Chrysler. So the fact that Mercury was given a minivan at all in 2004 was likely due to pressure from dealers to have something to compete with. Nissan still moved forward with the third gen Quest, basing on a platform shared with their Altima and Maxima sedans, and production moved to Nissan's new plant in Canton, Mississippi. Unlike the Chrysler and GM minivans, which didn't try too much to push the envelope in terms of style, the Quest did, and the result was, well at least I thought so at the time, simply weird. Nissan was clearly trying to make a minivan look cool, with its curved belt line and significant lack of any square edges. My Uber driver. But it was on the inside where the Quest went all out weird, with a then controversial decision to move the dashboard gauges to the center, and a large oval shaped center pod housing the shifter and controls for the radio and climate. In the back, passengers could have two roof mounted DVD screens, and an unusual moonroof arrangement with separate windows for each second and third row passenger, and each with its own sunshade. Although initial sales were an improvement from what the Quest had when it shared its design with Mercury, the futuristic look didn't translate to continued sales success, dropping to less than 20,000 for 2008, a mere fraction of what Chrysler continued to maintain. Nissan had plans for a new commercial van for their Mississippi plant and shut down the Quest production in 2009. But that still wasn't the end of the Nissan Quest. A fourth gen was launched in 2011, which was now, for the first time, an import from Japan. Looking nothing like the third gen, the fourth gen Quest went for a more boxy look in the rear, a clear sign to me that they tried to make up for going too weird with the previous model. This also translated to the interior, with a more conventional dashboard with the gauges back behind the steering wheel. Even the moonroof moved to a less radical design. But more importantly, this model didn't fare well in crash tests, in particular the overlap test that is one of the toughest to pass. Ultimately sales remained below the level reached in the last full year of the third gen. Canada stopped imports by 2014, and the US did the same in 2016 except for a few fleet sales for 2017. By the mid-2010s, North American sales of minivans had long since been dropped for both GM and Ford, and Toyota and Honda were holding their own against Chrysler. Minivans are still around today, but in far fewer numbers, except maybe for all those self-driving electric models from Chrysler out in Arizona. Of course, we will never see a new Mercury minivan again, thanks to Mercury dissolving over a decade ago. There's no one to fight here! Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe he just wanted to drive his Mercury Villager. <laughs> Nissan definitely had some interesting cars in their past that could be candidates for future episodes. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. Good morning. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid 2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time.